All right, continuing our conversation with Dr. Baumgartner, who's got the excellent book, which you need to make sure you read, South to Freedom. Uh, we are now jumping into an important question, uh, one that was, for me, left me with a lot to think about. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to hear your answer on this one, answers, I should say, on this one. So how does your book complicate our understanding of African-American citizenship by examining Mexico? I think it complicates our understanding in two ways. First, that it provides a point of comparison for African-American citizenship in the United States. That is how Mexico dealt with this problem. And that also expands our understandings of the opportunities for seeking out citizenship and political belonging in Mexico. So I'll start with the first part about the history of citizenship in Mexico as a point of comparison yes. to the history of citizenship rights in the United States. That in very, very broad strokes, the history of African-American citizenship in the United States is in the first half of the 19th century, really a story of declension, where in the early national period, some states are granting citizenship rights to people of color, but that generally those rights are being eroded and that erosion culminates in the Dred Scott decision of 1857, which among other things denies the fact that people of color could be or ever had been citizens at a national level. Right. And what's so remarkable about that story in comparison to Mexico is the fact that three months before Judge Ta Justice Tawney read his majority decision in Dred Scott v. Sanford, Mexico passed a new constitution, the Constitution of 1857, which came to the opposite conclusion as Justice Taney in all ways, but with respect to citizenship, it confirmed what had been longstanding practice in Mexico, which was that citizenship was not restricted on the basis of race and that people of African descent, including people of African descent who had been formerly enslaved in the United States were entitled to citizenship. And I think that this Comparison is important because it helps to show first that the what had happened in the United States, this history of declension, this history of African Americans claiming their citizenship, of having to assert cultural citizenship because yes. they were denied yes. legal citizenship, yes. that it didn't have to be that way, that there were other countries that had different sorts of citizenship laws that allowed, that gave citizenship to people of color. And the second reason that I think that this book complicates our understandings of African-American citizenship is because this isn't just two parallel histories, but they're intertwined histories because enslaved people were escaping to Mexico and claiming their citizenship under Mexico's laws that, it, that enslaved people and people of color were very much aware of what was going on in Mexico and they were eager to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. In Mexico, there were two ways in which foreigners could become naturalized as Mexican citizens. And the first way was by formally applying for naturalization, which usually was a pretty formal process that had to be confirmed either by Mexico's Congress or Mexico's president. But really incredibly, we have evidence that African-Americans who went to Mexico actually were able to secure naturalization by this process. And to give you just one example, there were a group of African-American men who applied for and were granted naturalization and their naturalization cards were signed by Mexico's president in itself. Wow. And they got that, they made that claim to citizenship because they had fought for an artillery company in Tampico during the US war with Mexico. So military service is a really important way in Mexico as it would be in, in the United States to make helping African-Americans to make claims to citizenship. So that formal way of naturalization was something that people of color African-Americans in Mexico were taking advantage of. 
The second way of securing citizenship in Mexico was less formal and therefore somewhat easier. And it has some comparisons to the cultural citizenship that we see African-Americans exercising in the United States, except in Mexico, it's sort of enshrined with legal, it has legal weight to it. Right. And by that, I mean that in Mexico, foreigners who owned property, joined the military, or performed, quote unquote, some honest and useful industry, close quote, mm -hmm. became citizens by default. They didn't need formal application. So it was, it was easier to right. have citizenship claims there, but it was harder to prove that you were in fact a citizen because there was no paper. Instead, you had to rely on your neighbors, members of your community to testify that you were in fact a citizen because you exercised those citizenship rights. And again, we see in the archives in Mexico, African-Americans who had moved to Mexico being accused of uh, being foreigners who hadn't applied for their residency visas and calling up their neighbors and their neighbors testifying, mm -hmm. no, this person had done X, Y, and Z, and therefore they were entitled to citizenship. They weren't, they were no longer foreigners. Right. And so there's this really interesting story about how African-Americans in Mexico were able to use both of these means for accessing citizenship in Mexico. Yeah, I mean, I'm just jotting down all these notes because uh, I'm going to be teaching this in future classes. It's, you're leaving me with a lot to process uh, in a great way. So I definitely just wanted to follow up with uh, just some for the audience as well. Uh, so uh, particularly, I think um, the way in which you've written about and you've discussed um, citizenship for African-Americans and foreigners in general to the country is that it sounds much more progressive, clearly, than the United States. Um, you know, as you talk about Dred Scott, and, and I often think, as you point out, the cultural citizenship, the aspiration to belong to some, you know, to the to this community. Um, I think of Benedict Anderson, right, as well, this imagined community, in this case, being the nation state, that in Mexico, that it's real. Like, you can belong. Obviously, that, as you point out, there are two ways to do it. But I think that was one of the points of your book that left me, I had to put it down for a second, because I was like, wait a minute, huh? Um, and it was such a profound point because I didn't know it. Um, and, and there was a part of curiosity uh, in me that wondered um, if you saw, as you did the research, um, if there was an influx uh, and migration as the years progressed, particularly during the war, the Civil War, um, once it becomes known that there is this avenue to not just leave for freedom, but to be recognized legally as a citizen of Mexico. And to have the rights and privileges that come with that, did you did you um, notice a migration, like a shift, uh, an influx? I'm just curious. Well, yeah, it's really hard to get a sense of the numbers mm -hmm. of enslaved people or even free African Americans who are going to Mexico right. for many of the reasons that, uh, or for the reason that, in 1821, Mexico abolished all distinctions of caste. And right. so the official documents that you would often use mm -hmm. to be able to reconstruct uh, who is coming and how long, you know, that right, sort right, of stuff, right. it's just not there. And right. it's further complicated, but so you can't tell from Mexico censuses, oh, is this, is this even a person of color? Right. And the other thing that's hard about that is that we have evidence, um, anecdotal evidence at least that enslaved people who escaped to Mexico changed their name. So even I was wondering it's, that as well. it's That's, really yeah. hard to, to kind of follow right. them in order to come up with numbers. And I, in the research process, that was really frustrating to me. But then <laughs> at imagine. the same time, it just stands testament to how the ingenuity of these enslaved people who right. were able not just to frustrate the efforts of their former enslavers to mm -hmm. return them to human bondage, but there, you know, the fact that I can't find the answer to our numbers increasing or not in any quantifiable way that's that's really stands testament to to the incredible feats no, yeah, that they were able to, right, like to do they're... but that said i think that it, in, in the 1850s we are seeing anecdotally there it seems like there are more enslaved people and more free blacks 
trying to go to Mexico. So I do think that there is an increase there, right. uh, even though I can't quantify it. It's mostly anecdotal. I, I wondered, as you, you say that, because I'm thinking of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, combined with Dred Scott and, and other instances of, of violence, right, to even free Blacks, that maybe some were reconsidering uh, their place their safety, yeah. their lives, yeah. ultimately, living in uh, the United States. Yeah. Also, I think you bring up an extra point um, that this is intertwined, right? That these are these histories are not in opposition, they're directly connected, um, which is interesting. And I think one of the reasons that I jumped towards your book, which we're gonna talk about shortly, is the, the aspect of military service as a pathway to citizenship, because what you just said, based and also from your research, I see this, your work is complicating when we talk about the United States colored troops, you know, at least during the Civil War era, and Frederick Douglass and, and Lucretia Mott and Anna Dickinson, I say this because I focus on Philly, um, but uh, just those individuals who talked about Black military service with the hope of getting citizenship, full citizenship, not the cultural, um, like actually being able to have access to, to vote, to freedom of movement, to, to, to live, uh, and all that comes with that, and you see it in Mexico as a reality versus it's a hope in, in the United States for the USCT, which to me is really profound. Um, and I, I'm, I would love to see more scholars, you know, bring that acknowledgement um, with what's happening in the South, uh, because I'll be honest, if an, an enslaved person who for the most part makes up the majority of the USCT, leaving to go to Mexico where you get those rights and freedoms and privileges and it's ingrained and in, as you said enshrined in legal documents signed by potentially the president there's no question versus the hope and obviously there's the complication that we talk about leaving your family your community but you also bring up the the connections to the Mexican community right that that and it's really until they've gone through the transition this very melting pot kind of society you have all these different groups of people coming together and supporting claims of freedom for black people which to me is that's profound uh and and obviously there's a, a number of those instances happening in canada but as you point out we need to recognize that it's happening in mexico as well and that there is actual tangible proof for them getting their citizenship rights i did have a follow-up question as it relates to military service and the claims of citizenship do you you mentioned um, those who own property, um, those who are considered industrious broadly, clearly. Um, how does that play out of like, is there, what is the path would it have been for an African-American woman, um, you know, or, or, you know, young girl um, trying to gain their freedom and making it? Do they, do they successfully do that? Um, or have, do you see that in the record? If not, you know, maybe that's a new project for someone else, but I, that is something that, that popped my interest on. Is there a gendered component? To this as well? That's a great question. And luckily, there's a really wonderful historian who's finishing her PhD at UT Austin, Maria Estehamak, who is working on female freedom seekers to mm. Mexico. So I'm hoping she'll be able to, I'm not hoping, she will be <laughs> uh, you know, expanding on yes. what the, the sort of what I can sketch out here, mm. that I was really surprised and pleased at the number at the number of, or the amount of evidence that I was able to find about enslaved women mm. escaping to yes. Mexico. Right. And, but as you're pointing out, the, the routes to citizenship in Mexico were quite gendered. I mean, military mm. service women clearly were not uh, allowed to participate in military service, owning property. Uh, they could, but it was much less common right. and useful industry. Uh, and, and in most of the evidence that I was able to find of people of color, African Americans exercising the rights of citizenship in Mexico, whether that's by serving as justices of the peace in their local mm. community, for instance, that was mostly men. Mm. And so understanding the ways in which female freedom seekers were able to exercise those rights is something that that um, Maria Esperhamak will, will be filling in for me. But they one of the things that I thought was so interesting, and it touches back on something you were mentioning before, was that mm -hmm. the Mexican communities into which freedom seekers escaped mm -hmm 
provided a um, belonging to such an extent that Mexican citizens, Mexican officials were sometimes risking their lives to protect fugitive slaves. And maybe I'll just give one example here um, from 1850, where an enslaved woman named Matilde Genes was attempted to be kidnapped in the middle of the night by her former enslaver, William Cheney. And William Cheney was from Louisiana. Uh, he owned a plantation near Cheneyville named after his father. And what's so fortuitous about the fact that he was in Cheneyville is it's right near where Solomon Northrup was mm. illegally enslaved. And Northrup writes in his memoir about how there had been a, a, a plot to escape to Mexico several years before he mm. was okay. sold there and that he knew that Mexico promised this freedom. So we're seeing um, through Solomon Northrup that, that in this area, there was knowledge about Mexico's laws. Mm. And Matilda Hennis at some point, although we don't know when or why or how, was able to escape to Mexico. And she found work in the household of a man named Manuel Luis del Fiero in the town of Reynosa, Tamaulipas. And in the midst of being kidnapped, Matilda Hennis's employer, um, Del Fiero hears the noise and comes down with his gun and violently threatens to shoot her kidnapper. Um, and his wife calls for help from their balcony. And the William Cheney, this Louisiana slaveholder, is thrown into jail while the local uh, district judge investigates his kidnapping, which is just this. I, that was actually one of the first documents I came across when I was doing this research. And it was just mind blowing to me that this Louisiana slaveholder who, who in Louisiana really could have done most what he wanted with his right. property is now finding in Mexico that he cannot treat people of color with impunity. And so even though we don't have, or I wasn't able to find the evidence of enslaved women or, or female freedom seekers exercising the political rights of, of citizenship in the same way that men do. They are ensconced in these communities. They do have this measure of belonging within their communities, um, which thinking back to Stephen Kantrowitz's amazing book, that that belonging is an important part of the attempts to secure freedom. Yeah, I mean, I've just recently um, been reading some of Ed Ayer's classic works. And even as you're talking about this story, it's making me think of the examples of um, some white Pennsylvanians who um, are going to defend, um, as Lee is doing his campaign into Pennsylvania, the, the freedom and rights for those from the community as they're being stolen, uh, as uh, Dr. Hillary Green calls it, stolen ones into the Confederacy. Uh, at the same time, hearing you say this also makes me realize that I need to be and others should be more uh, acknowledging of the fact that through these examples that you're highlighting, that the, the Mexican government and the communities uh, broadly are engaged in abolitionist activism, right? And it's in ways that I have never thought about until reading your work. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm so grateful for this and also really excited uh, for the, the new scholarship that's going to be coming on the horizon. So thank you for that plug. And hopefully when she's done, I would love to have her on here as well. So thank you for that.